Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Can we put our hands together for Jesus tonight? Hallelujah. He's worthy of the praise. Come on, we can do better than that. Let's put our hands together for Jesus tonight. Come on, church, let's give him the praise tonight. Hallelujah. Well, listen, if you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to grab whatever you've got the word on, if you've got a device, if you've got your Bibles with you. Let's take a little journey into the Word of God. In 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, and we'll begin reading at the 25th verse, 2 Kings 4, and we'll start at the 25th verse because I believe that God wants to speak to us through a very familiar story, familiar to many of us, maybe new to some, but I believe that as we look into this story, God is going to breathe new life into it and speak to us in a fresh way and increase our faith tonight. 2 Kings 4 and 25. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with your child? And she answered, all is well. Somebody say, all is well. And when she came to the mountain, to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone. For she is in bitter distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? He said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply and lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives, as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound. Somebody say no sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told him, the child has not awakened. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child laying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her and when she came into him, he said, pick up your son. She came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. Can you say amen? amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you the praise. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. God, we trust you tonight. And we ask you to speak to us. In the name of Jesus, God, we're standing here as your sons and daughters saying, God, as you speak to us, God, we want to do 
all that you say. We want to be more than hearers tonight, but we want to be doers of your word. Help us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and let's give Jesus the glory. So I was eight years old, and we were taking a family trip from New Jersey to California, and we were leaving from Philadelphia, the Philadelphia airport, because that's the airport that was the closest to where we lived in South Jersey. And we were flying to San Francisco. And I remember that day, and what you should know about eight-year-old Freddie is that I was terrified to fly. I did not like it. And we flew a lot. We traveled a lot. But every single time was like the first time. I couldn't stand it. And I was scared. And I remember we were taking this trip. And this particular time, somewhere between leaving the house and going to the Philadelphia airport, I made the unilateral decision that I wasn't going to go. I made up in my mind that I was going to put my foot down. I'm not flying anymore. I'm done with it. And I said, I'm going to let my parents go ahead. They can go to California. They can visit and they can come back. But I'm just going to take care of myself until they get there. After all, I am eight. I mean, it'd be one thing if I was six, but I'm eight. I'm a man now. I can put my foot down and I can take care of my Self. Well, in my eight-year-old wisdom, I decided that the best time to let them know that I wasn't going was at the gate. <laughs> so we packed up all the bags and we left the house. We made our way to the airport. We got to the airport and we checked our bags and we got our tickets and we went through security and we went through the terminal and we got to the gate. All the while, I'm just working up the courage to Let them know I'm not going to go. So we get to the gate, and I realize this is my chance. This is my moment. This is my opportunity. So I let them know. I say, hey, I got an announcement. I'm not going. My parents, what what are you talking about? You're not going. I said, I've decided I'm not going to go, but I'm going to stay. And my parents said, well, no, you're going to go. And I, you know, I put on a little bit of a performance because I felt like this is my chance and I can't take any chances because this is now or never. So I said, no, I'm not going to go. And you know how when you act up in public, your parents, you can identify with this. When you act up in public and your parents talk to you without moving their lips, do you know what I'm talking about? When they, it, you know, it's like they become ventriloquists, you know, they... They're not moving their lips because they don't want anybody who's not in earshot to be able to read their lips and to be able to see that really they're threatening your life. Do you know what I'm talking about? Boy, if you don't get on this plane, you're not going to worry about the plane because I will take you out myself. But that didn't do it. That didn't do it. I put on a performance, and it was so bad that they had to get the pilot to come off of the plane for this little eight-year-old boy to get me to get on the plane. So the pilot comes off, and I tell him exactly how it is. I told him, I said, you know, I'm really scared to fly. And he said, oh, son, it's nothing to be scared of. It's the safest way to travel. So I said, are you sure? Are you sure that we're going to make it there? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, don't worry. We're going to make it. I promise. Well, it was stormy that day. And so when we took off off the runway, there was a lot of turbulence. It was very bumpy. And I got worried. I got really scared. I'm thinking to myself, this is exactly why I wanted to stay home. But then I remembered his words. I remembered the words of the pilot. Don't worry. We're going to make it. I promise. Well, halfway through the flight, the pilot comes on and he says, hey, we're getting ready to hit some turbulence. So I'm going to turn the fastened seatbelt sign on. 
It's going to get a little bumpy. Well, sure enough, it did. The plane started bouncing around up there. And I almost got worried, but I remembered the pilot's words. He said, don't worry. We're going to make it. I promise. Well, we get to San Francisco and we're getting ready to land. And it gets even bumpier still. If you know anything about San Francisco, they call it the Bay Area. And there's a lot of clouds, low clouds, a lot of fog. And as we're descending, it's really bumpy. I mean, now it's real turbulence. But I was actually fine at that point because I had meditated so much on what that pilot told me. That as that plane was bouncing around in the air, I said, oh, no, it's going to be fine because the pilot told me not to worry because we're going to make it. And he promised me. Now, what was happening to me? Well, I could deal with the turbulence because the pilot had given me a guarantee that all would be well. Now, I was too young to realize it at the time. But as I got a little older, I realized that the pilot was making me a promise that he did not have the power or the authority to keep. And I know he was well-intentioned, but he, like me, was limited. Even though he was the pilot and he had experience and skill flying the plane in the air, he is not in control of the air. But there is somebody who can speak to the wind and even the wind has to obey him. And every promise that he makes, he has both the power and the authority to back it up. I came here tonight to tell somebody that God's promises are still good. His promise never to leave you is still good. His promise to be faithful to you is still good. His promise that he has a plan for you is still good. In fact, his promise that that plan is good is still good. Or you ought to give God some praise for a few seconds for his promises are still good. Well, the great American evangelist D.L. Moody put it like this. God never made a promise that was too good to be true. And I know that he's right because when God makes a promise, he doesn't have to check with anybody. He doesn't have to consult with anybody. And your limitations don't limit him because he's God. And that's the confidence that we have that nothing can stop God from doing what he wants to do good in your life. As a matter of fact, I'm so glad that he doesn't need my resume. He doesn't need to check my credit report. Uh, He doesn't need my LinkedIn profile or any references to find out if I qualify or if I deserve what he's promised me. Of course, I don't deserve what he's promised me, but that's what makes him God. That's what makes him good, because even though I don't deserve it, he still called me blessed. And if he said it, he has both the power and the authority to back it up. Somebody ought to just go ahead and say, his promises are still good. Well, I'm saying all of this because so much of what's happening in the story that we just read in 2 Kings is the result of one woman believing in one promise from God. It was a wealthy woman who met the prophet Elisha, and she honored him, and she blessed him. And as a result, she received what we would call a prophet's reward. Now, she was a wealthy woman, but what I love here is that she wasn't so blinded by her wealth and her status and her influence that God couldn't get to her heart and reveal himself to her through the prophet. But she was able to see a value in Elisha that wasn't on the outside, but that was on the inside. And the ninth verse tells us what she said, because when she was talking to her husband, she said, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. He was a holy man. 
She was able to see this because she was able to perceive a value that was in Elijah that wasn't on the outside, but that was all on the inside. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be a holy man than a rich man. I'd rather be a holy man than a famous man. I'd rather be a holy man than a powerful man. Because a holy man isn't desperate for money or for power or for fame. Because when God is with you, you're automatically blessed. Uh, But a, a holy man doesn't need money to make him blessed. I don't need money to make me blessed. I just really need a relationship with God. Because if I have a relationship with God, everything that's missing in my life, I'll find it in him. So this woman saw a value in Elisha that wasn't on the outside, but that was all on the inside because he was a holy man. Somebody say holy man. So what did she do? Well, verse 10 tells us. She says to her husband, let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. She was intentional. She made it a point to bless the prophet. And she and her husband, they obviously had meals with them, and they welcomed him, and they adjusted their schedule for Elijah's arrival. But what we see in verse 10 is that they didn't stop there. They also made room for him. They built a room for the prophet to stay in so that whenever he came to to town, he would have a place to rest. Uh, They made room. Somebody say room. Uh, and, And she didn't realize it at the time, but by making room, she was setting herself up for the greatest miracle of her life. But when we look at this, we have to see that there was a progression there because they went from making room in their schedule to making room and building a room in their life. And I guess my question to you tonight is, how much room are you willing to make for God to have his way in your life? I I, I, I look at this and and I see that they made room for Elijah. Uh, they, They never made room for Elijah. They would have missed the greatest blessing of their life if they, if they didn't do that, but they made room for him. They went from making room for him in, his, in their schedule to making room for him in their lives, and God changed their lives. And tonight, maybe you've just made room for God in your schedule, but I want to tell you tonight that God wants more than a Tuesday night. He wants more than a Sunday morning. He wants room in your life. Is there anybody in this room or watching online who would simply say tonight that I want to make room for Jesus in my life tonight? I don't just want to make room for Jesus in my schedule, but I want to make room for Jesus in my life. So I'm going to make some room. Somebody say, make some room. Uh, See, I'm what they would call a PK. As Pastor Tim was saying earlier, uh, I'm a pastor's kid. So I grew up in church. I grew up going to prayer meeting. I grew up going to Bible study. I grew up going to Sunday school and choir rehearsal and revival. So it felt like I was in church every single night of the week. And it was not optional It was a necessary component of the schedule. If I was living in that house, I was going to church. But I'm not standing here tonight because my parents made room for God in our schedule. I'm standing here tonight because my parents made room for God in our lives. It wasn't just come to church on Sunday, but in the morning before I went to school, they prayed over me. Before I went to basketball practice, they prayed over me. They made room for God in their lives. And so now that I've gotten older, I want Jesus not just in my schedule, but I want him in my So I'm making room for Jesus in my life. She made room for Elisha, and in return, Elisha blessed her. Now, it's coming from Elisha, but really it's God. 
who sees this woman's heart and wants to bless her. So here's the blessing. Verse 16 says, about this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. She was a very wealthy woman, and anyone looking at her from the outside would have thought that she had everything that she could ever want. But that's because we look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Uh, there, there was something that she desired that she didn't speak about. Uh, and, and this verse says it. Uh, it says, her response was, no, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. So obviously she wanted a son. She wanted a boy, but she wanted it so bad that she was afraid to believe for it. She didn't speak about it simply because she was afraid to hope. Have you ever been there? Afraid to hope. There's something that's so delicate to you, something that's so precious to you that you're scared to even say it for fear that hope would rise up in you and maybe you'll be disappointed. And what's interesting is that we look into the text and it's very clear that she never asks for a son, but she didn't have to because God knew her heart. And the remarkable thing is that in the middle of mastering the universe, in the middle of keeping the stars in the sky, in the middle of keeping the world on its axis, in the middle of keeping the laws of physics and gravity operating, he's still so concerned about this one little family and this woman that he searches her heart, that while he's upholding the entire universe, he searches her heart for her deepest desire only so he can bless her. I'm talking to somebody tonight who needs to hear that God has not forgotten about you. Despite what you're going through, I want you to know that God has not forgotten about you. Maybe you feel like God is indifferent to what you're going through, but I want you to know that you are on the mind of God. You are on the thoughts of God, and he knows everything that you're going through. He knows everything that you're experiencing, and he's concerned about you. But if tonight you have some trouble could it be that he's just allowing you to go through what you're going through so that he can get your faith to the next level? And see, what, what I found about God is that his top priority is not whether or not you have everything that you want, but whether or not you trust him. Because out of this will flow every decision and every choice and every move that you make. So if he has to, he'll take you through a valley in order to get your faith to increase. And I wonder even right now if there's anybody watching this uh, who can say that you've learned so much more about God in the valley than you ever did on the mountaintop. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And if he had to go through, don't you think you can go around or go under? As long as you live this life, you're going to have to go through some things. But I've learned to trust him in the valley. I learned how to trust him in the storm. I learned how to trust him in the trouble. I learned how to hold on to him when everything in me was saying, let go. I learned how to trust him in the worst moments in my life. And now I can say, yay, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art I learned how to trust him. I learned how to, oh, I need somebody in here who said, I learned how to trust him to go ahead and throw your hands up and say, I trust you. I trust you. It was good for me to go through it. It was good for me to take it. It was good for me to go through it because now I know that you've got me. And I can say like Job, my ears had heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. 
Oh, I wish I had maybe two or three people in here who would just lift up a praise and give God the glory because he's with you in the storm. Woo, Shama. Somebody give him a shout in here. You watching online, give him a shout where you are. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, that's a good place to praise him. That's a good place to praise him. He didn't let me drown. He didn't let me fall. Woo. I've had some difficulties, but I trust him. I've had some setbacks, but I trust him. And this is what happened to this woman because she's in a situation where the greatest blessing of her life gets taken from her. This boy was given to her as a blessing. She meets the prophet Elisha. She blesses the prophet. The prophet blesses her with a son. He says to her, before a year's time is up, you will have a son. She has the son. The son grows up to be a boy, young boy. And then she's plunged into the valley. It started like any normal day. Her son was with his father working in the field, but suddenly he started complaining that his head was hurting. Well, dad did what any good dad would do. Said, well, take him to his mother. <laughs> they take the boy to his mother, but by noon he dies. And so her world is turned upside down, and she finds herself in this tension between what God has promised her and what God has allowed to happen to her. In other words, she's caught in between the promise of God and the providence of God. God promised her a son. He gave her a son, but now he's gone. And we see her in this moment, moving in faith, choosing to hold on to God's promise, even though it seems like all is lost. Now, let's look at this because, see, I've found that much of life is lived in this same tension. We all at some point have found ourselves in circumstances that are in direct conflict with what God said he was doing in our lives. And yet God is still requiring of us through all of that to trust him. Because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. And in fact, the just don't walk by sight, but the just walk by faith. She's holding on to this promise, and she's not going by what she sees. She's going by what she believes. And she shows us what it looks like when you hold on to the promises of God, even if it takes a little time for what you're going through to catch up to what God said. Oh, somebody ought to just say, hold on. I'm holding on. Uh, if he's promised it in his word, then no matter what's happening in my circumstance, I have his permission to believe for it, to believe his word against what's happening to me. The hymn writer said it like this, standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God, I shall prevail. You say it. I'm standing on the promises. She's in this devastating situation, but she exhibits a level of resolve and determination only because of what she believed, because of what she's standing on. She's standing in the darkest valley, but she has hope because she's standing on a promise. So then that shows me that it's not where you're standing that's significant, but it's what you're standing on. I might be standing in the crisis, but I'm standing on his word. I might be standing in the storm, but I'm standing on his word. And as long as I'm standing on his word, then I believe that everything is going to be all right. And so look at this because her son dies. Now, what's her first reaction? Her first thought is, I've got to get to the man of God. 
She tells her husband, and her husband uh, is confused. He doesn't know what's happening. And she says to him, I need a donkey, and I need a servant, because I've got to get to the man of God. Now, he's saying, well, it's not Sunday. It's not time for church. It's not new moon. What are you talking about? And her response is, all is well. And then she gets to uh, Elisha, and Elisha sees her from afar off and sends Gehazi, his servant, to go and ask her how she's doing. Gehazi goes to her and asks her three questions. Now, had it have been me, I would have taken that opportunity to tell him everything that's going on with me. Like, oh, you asked, so now I'm going to tell you. And so Gehazi asks her these three questions that Elisha told her to ask. He said, ask her, is she well? Is her husband well? And is her son well? Gehazi asked her the question, and her response is, all. And it's amazing because we're looking at this here, and we're realizing that she really does believe that God can turn this around. And it's amazing how what you believe, you really don't know what you really believe until it's tested. Uh, Because... This is a testing. And yet she replies and says, all is well. Now, in the Navy, they would battle test ships. It doesn't matter how modern the ship is. It doesn't matter how many guns the ship has. It doesn't matter how advanced the technology on the battleship. They have to battle test the ship to make sure that it can handle the battle. And what they're really trying to make sure is, is that it can take a hit and continue with the mission. You can say you believe a lot of things, but God sometimes will allow you to go through crisis so that your faith can be battle tested. Because the question is, can you take the hit and continue the mission? James says it like this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, that you might be battle-tested. Is there anybody in here who would just go ahead and say, I want to be battle-tested. I want to make sure that I can take a hit and continue with the mission. Well, she responds, and she's in the greatest crisis of her life, but she says, all is well. And I have to look at this and ask myself, how often do I go through a crisis and my response is, all is well? Mm. How many times can I say, all is well, going through the storm? Well, how do you say, all is well, when the bottom drops out? How do you say, all is well, when you're buried under the cares of life? How do you say all is well when by every metric all is not well? Well, you can only say all is well when you realize that God is still in control. Uh, She's able to say all is well because though she lost her boy, she hasn't lost her faith. And in fact, she believes that it's her faith that's going to cause this loss to only be temporary. She has no evidence. She has no signs of life. She has nothing to go on. Yet she believes that God can restore her son back to her. So she's able to hope against hope with nothing in her hand but a promise from the Lord. And she's believing that God has the power to restore what she's lost. And I love this because when I look at this, I realize that It really was up to the faith of the mother for this boy to be raised from the dead. Uh, Because anybody else would have said, it's over. Anybody else would have said, go ahead and call it. You know, in the hospital, they call it time of death. What's the time of death? Anybody else would have said, it's over. But it really depended on her to believe for her son so that he might be raised. 
Every time they asked her status, she said, all is well. She's not saying it for her. She's saying it for him. And you know she had to wrestle with her thoughts. She had to wrestle with the thought, it's over. But how did she respond? All is well. You know she had the thought, what's the time of death? But her response is, all is well. You know she was thinking, but there's no pulse. And she said, all is well. But his body is cold. But she said, all is well. But he's not breathing anymore. But she said, all is well. Because I believe that the one who put breath in his body in the first place has the power to put it back. So no matter what I'm looking at, I can say all is well. I love that because that sounds just like a mother. She said, I'm not giving up right here. I'm the one that nurtured him. I'm the one that fed him. I'm the one that birthed him for nine months. I carried him. So I'm not going out like that. I will believe God's word for him to be raised from the dead. And if God didn't promise him, I would already be planning the funeral. But because God promised him, then I'm going to keep on praying until God turns it around. Winston Churchill said it like this, never, never, never give up. And when you've got a promise from the Lord, you better never, never, never give up. Because maybe you're praying not for you, but for somebody else. Maybe you're praying not for you, but for a family member. Maybe you're praying not for you, but for a co-worker. And maybe their life depends on you holding on to the promise from the Lord. What are you going to do? Are you going to let the circumstance override your faith? Or are you going to say faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen? I might not see it right now, but I believe that if I hold on, I'm going to see God turn it around. Oh, I dare somebody to just go ahead and throw your hands up and say, I believe God. So, so what happens? So what happens? Let's fast forward. So he... Elijah comes to the house. Now, what he did initially was he sent his servant to the house with his staff. And he said, lay this staff on the boy. Now, he's moving in faith, but that's not what God is about to use. And so his servant goes to the house to the boy, lays the staff on the boy, and nothing happens. So now Elijah gets there. And... Elijah gets in the room, and what does he do? He shut the door. Somebody say, shut the door. Sometimes you've got to shut the door on unbelief. Sometimes you've got to shut the door on negative words. Sometimes you've got to shut the door on the past. The past is the past, but I'm believing God can do something that my past can't stop. So I shut the door. Sometimes you've got to shut the door on doubt. Sometimes you've got to shut the door on your limitations and say, I'm shutting the door so that I can pray. Elijah gets in the room and he starts to pray. Now, what I love about this is that it's prayer that God's about to use which I love prayer because it's an equalizer. Elijah is the prophet of God, and yet he still has to pray because it's not by might, nor is it by power, but it's by the spirit of the living God, so he prayed. Now, what's interesting about this is when I was coming up in the church, we used to call uh, the old mothers of the church prayer warriors. Have you heard that term before? Prayer warriors. If you heard that term, raise your hand if you heard it. Prayer warriors. And I don't know how I feel about that term anymore because it almost sounds like they were stronger at praying than somebody else. But prayer is an expression of weakness. It's saying, God, I can't do this on my own, so I pray. 
So the real prayer warrior in your life is the person who's the best at saying, God, I'm limited. God, I can't do it on my own. God, I have nothing left. God, I'm empty. You got to fill me. God, I have no more strength, but I believe that if I pray, you are faithful to hear my prayer and you will answer. I need somebody in here to go ahead and say, I've got to pray. I've got to pray until I see turnaround. I've got to pray until I see victory. I'm willing to call on God until he answers the situation. And so Elijah's in the room and he's praying. Now, this is the thing. He stretches out over the boy's body and then he gets up and he's pacing some more, probably praying. And then he stretches out over the body again. And then the boy sneezes. So he stretches out over the body and the body gets warm. He gets up and he's praying. There's still no signs of life. And then he stretches out over the boy again and the boy sneezes seven times. And what's interesting is when you look at this, it's a long process. And sometimes I think that we look at things and we're looking for miracles to be instantaneous. And we're, we're looking for the miraculous to happen immediately. And when it doesn't happen immediately, we don't feel like God is doing something miraculous anymore. But some miracles just take time. Oh, somebody just say that. Some miracles just take time. Well, what am I saying? Well, it's a miracle that you're still here. It's a miracle that you, that you got here tonight. It's a miracle that you're still holding on after all that you've been through. Oh, I wonder if there's any people in here who have a testimony who can say, I've been through some valleys, I've been through some hills, but I'm still here. I've been through some storms, but I'm still here. I've been through some struggles, but I'm still here. And that, my friends, is a miracle. Oh, maybe some of you still don't believe me. Well, let me tell you like this. Every time you look in the mirror, you're looking at a miracle. Every time you look in the mirror, what's staring back at you is a miracle. Oh, you still don't believe me. Well, let me help you. A miracle is anything that shouldn't be, but because of God, it is. So you still shouldn't be here. But you survived. You survived shutdowns. You survived breakdowns. You survived heartache and pain. And you're still here giving God the praise as a living, breathing miracle. Oh, I dare somebody to go ahead and give him the praise for his power. Hey, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm a miracle. So now, now look at this. Look at this. We're going to wrap it up. Woo. Woo. Oh, just two or three people. Why don't you just go ahead and give God the praise that after all you've been through, you have the strength to stand. It's a miracle. It's a miracle you took the one train and got here. It's a miracle you took the E train and got here. You didn't feel like coming after everything you've been through, but it's a miracle that there was something in you that still said, but if I can just get to the house of God, I believe that God can do something with my life. I believe he can heal. I believe he can deliver. I believe he can set free. I believe he's able. Woo. Woo. Oh, don't do that. Don't think about how far he's brought you. Because when you think about how far he's brought you, your hand just starts going up. When I think about how far he's brought me, my feet just start moving. When I think about how far he's brought me, I have to lift up my voice and say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. 
He's in the hospital room. He's in the hospital room. He, he's in the room. He's in with this boy, but he's in there. This boy is dead. He's laying on the bed they built for Elijah. The blessing they received is laying dead in the room they made for God. What do you do? How do you hold on? And all they could do is pray. Have you ever been there? Well, all you could do was pray. I don't have any more words to say. I don't have nothing else to do. I'm out of options, but I know I can call on the name of the Lord. Elisha's praying. And what happens is the boy sneezes seven times. Now, I look at that, and that's interesting because what is a sneeze? Why a sneeze? Well, I look at it and I say, well, the definition of a sneeze is air leaving the body. But if air is leaving the body, then that must mean that somebody put some air back in the body. Those sneezes were a sign of life. And the only way that I can can put it to you is if you're in the hospital room and somebody's laying there dead and all you hear is and he's praying hearing and he said God I know you're able God I know you can do it God I still trust you God I still believe your word and then when the boy sneezed, it went from boop. The sneezes came out. And look, to you, it might just be a sneeze. But when you've been burdened with the silence of death, those sneezes were a sound of life. In other words, Elijah's praying. And when the boy sneezes, this is what he heard. Boop, 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 boop. I wonder if there's anybody in this room or watching online who said, I'm going to pray until I hear the beep of life. I'm going to pray until I hear sneezes. I'm going to pray until I hear a sound that said there's still life. God can breathe life back into the dead situation that you're dealing with. Oh, I just need two or three people to go ahead and lift your hands and say, I'm trusting in the Lord. The boy wakes up and Elisha tells the woman, come in, pick up your son and go out. Now imagine this. Imagine how she would raise that boy after seeing God raise him from the dead. Do you think she would let that boy get entangled in something that would squander his life and his potential after all that they did to trust God for him to come back to life? Imagine the faith that this woman would have before she had faith to believe that God could give her the desires of her heart. But when he raised her boy from the dead, now she has the capacity to believe God to be Lord of life itself. And she exhibits such amazing faith, and it's a remarkable thing because of what she was going through. But when you know Jesus, I said, when you know Jesus, you know the only one who knows the reason why you're alive, the reason why you're breathing, the reason why you're still standing, the reason why you're still here. And when you trust him, with your life, 
whatever's dead in your life, he has the power to resurrect it. I don't care how long it's been dead. Maybe you have a dead marriage. Maybe you have a dead prayer life. Maybe you have a dead dream. Maybe you have dead relationships in your life. Maybe you're just riddled with depression over regret. Jesus is the only one that can breathe new life back into a life that has expired. And the truth is that we all have a need for Jesus to breathe new life back into a life that was expired. How do I know that? Because I did it. I grew up in church, but I was not always saved. Because just going to church isn't enough. You can't just make room for Jesus in your schedule. That's religion. But Jesus wants you to make room for him in your life. That's relationship. Tonight, if you feel like you're living a dead life, God can raise that life from the dead. Well, how, you would say. Say, Freddie, how is that possible? Well, that's possible because of what Jesus told us. Jesus himself said, if you want new life, you have to be born Again, what does that mean? Well, you all have a natural birth. I have a natural birth. I have a natural birthday. Mine is May 23rd, 1981. It's my natural birth. But I need a spiritual birth. And the only way to have that is to be born again. Jesus said that no man can see the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. Again, that's what Jesus said. Born again is not my word. It's not Pastor Tim's word. It's not a Times Square church word. It's not a Christianity word. It is a Jesus word. Jesus told us that we must be born again. We say, well, how do I do that? That sounds difficult. It's actually very easy. And it really is as easy as A, B, C. A means to admit Admit that I'm a sinner. Admit that I'm broken on the inside. And you can do that tonight. If, if you've lived enough life without Jesus, you know that. You know that there's brokenness that you just can't fix. No program can do it. No priest can do it. Only Jesus can do it. You have to admit it, though. You have to admit that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus' help. Well, then that leads us to the B. And the B is just simply believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Believe that he died for your sins and believe that he rose again so that you can rise in new life. It's not enough for me to have gone to church every day. I had to believe because we're saved through faith. You don't have to do works. You don't have to get good to get God. But if you get God, God will come into your life and he will transform that life. He will change you tonight. He'll do that tonight. And then that leads us to the sea. And the sea is simply confess. Confess Jesus as Lord of your life. And that simply is what I was talking about before in the message. When I said you can't just make Jesus, give Jesus room in your schedule. But you have to make room for Jesus in your life, to have his way, to be Lord of your life. I've seen what my life looks like when I'm in charge. You've seen what your life looks like when you're in charge. Try Jesus tonight. Because if he takes control of your life, he will do what you can't possibly do. And so as every head is bowed, and every eye is closed. Nobody's looking around but me. Every head's bowed and every eye is closed. In about 10 seconds, I'm going to give you the opportunity to be born again. I'm not going to tell you to stand up. I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise that. I'm not going to tell you to come down to the front. I promise you. 
I'm not going to tell you to do anything like that, but I am going to ask you as everybody's head is bowed and as nobody's looking around but me, I'm the only one looking around, I am going to ask you just as a sign of faith to lift up one hand. In about five seconds, I'm going to ask you to lift up one hand so that Jesus can come into your life and change it so you can have joy, peace, and hope, and a future. If that's you and you're saying, Freddie, please include me in that prayer. Include me in that born again prayer. I don't want to miss out tonight, but I want you to include me right now while nobody's looking. Just please slip your hand up without hesitation. Just slip your hand up all over the room. I see it. Come on, just lift it up. One, two, three, four, real high. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I see it. Twelve. Come on, real high. Keep it up. Thirteen. Fourteen. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, you can put your hands down. Can we give God praise? Hallelujah. Look, let's pray, and we're all going to pray this together. We're all going to pray this together, and we're not going to leave you out, but we're all going to do it together. Are you ready? Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. I believe that you faced hell just for me so that I would not have to go. And you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Now come on real loud, everybody. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give God the praise. Hallelujah. 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 You've just made the greatest decision of your entire life. And there's no looking back. That woman left that room and she never had to look back to a day where she didn't have hope. Today, that's you. You never have to go back to a day where you don't have hope. If that's you, this is what I want you to do really quickly. You can take out your phone and I want you to do me a favor and text the word decided to 15, or excuse me, 51,000. Text the word decided to the number 51,000. We're not going to send you anything crazy. We're not going to ask for money. None of that. All we want to do is help you with your next steps on your journey with God. Isn't the Lord good tonight? Come on, church. Let's give Jesus glory, honor, and praise.